Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ambli Jaisindran, a research scholar of the, of the Department of Commerce. Now, we have gathered here to actively take part in the lecture series, uh, which is organized by the Department of Commerce, School of Business Management and Legal Studies, University of Kerala. Now, now joining us today, we have Professor R. Ram Kumar of Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. He will be enlightening us about his recent work on impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the Indian economy, a critical assessment. Now, known for his revolutionary outlook and intriguing ideologies, I'm sure that uh, we can look forward to a very engaging session. Without any further ado, let us uh, start the session. Uh, we have with us our most revered Dr. G. Raju, professor and head of the department, Department of Commerce. Uh, sir, uh, please, uh, please uh, come ahead and uh, welcome the online forum, sir. Sir. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Most respected guest and resource person of today, Professor R. Ram Kumar, our moderator, our own faculty, Dr. Simon Thirty, our own dean, faculty of commerce, Dr. Sia Begum. Dr. Harry, Professor of our department, Dr. Bijuti, Associate Professor of our department, then the organizer of this program, Dr. Biju A.V., Program Assistant, Mr. Binu Ashu, Lishmi, our own department faculty, our respected teachers, research scholars, Dear students and my dear friends, today evening we have an interesting session on this impact of COVID-19 on Indian economy. About the impact of this COVID-19, we read so many articles in newspapers and channels, we listen to so many discussions on all these things. Of course, so many reports are also coming out based on this one. As per uh, some of the report, one report published by Fitch, the global economy is going to get down by around 4.4%. In tune with the global economy, almost all the country's growth are showing a downward trend, including China, even though the China had shown some positive growth rate. If you look at some of the recent newspaper cuttings, you can see that the IMF had predicted that Indian economy or the GDP growth rate is contracted by 4.5%. Then another report that to very reason, Asian Development, Asian Development Bank had predicted a decline of 4% in our GDP growth rate. Same as that of the World Bank, they are much more positive in the sense that they predicted the Indian economy, the growth rate is going down by only 3.2%. Another interesting information given by the UN, UNDP report, it published in absolute term and they had mentioned based on a sex wise impact and they had stated that 87 million women is going to be under poverty in 2020 by this year in which may go up to 100 million women and girls should be below poverty line. Poverty line means whose income is less than 1.90 per dollar. So from 87 million people in 2020, not million people, not women, 87 million women is going to increase by increase to 100 million girls and women will come under the poverty line bracket of uh, by 2020-21. Okay, again, another report that Goldman Sachs, that is most interesting, the GDP growth rate of India is going to down by 14.8%. Whereas, the same trend you can see in globally also, in Nigeria, they predicted the growth rate may be lower by 5.4%, Africa 8%, Mexico 10.5%, Brazil 9.1%, USA 8%. Uh, these are the growth rate 
downward trend in most of the countries one interesting thing only china yeah some agency had predicted the growth rate of in, uh, china will be increased by 1% whereas fitch the rating agency had predicted that the china's growth rate may be 2.7% a positive figure but when you see the growth rate of china during the past years all these growth rate are the downward only a positive growth rate is predicted for this china support so this is the picture so you can see that there is a worldwide decline in growth rate of course millions of people are out of employment just because of the covid impact and along with the other countries our government also announced a package on this may 13th which the government claims that it comes around 10% of gdp or like the global countries the government of india claims that it may be around 10% and they claim that with that package indian economy can be revived but the recent report or recent prediction given by these global agencies or these rating agencies show that the claim of the government of india may not be the right one of course when you analyze the government of india claim that the government is trying to rebuild the economy with some monetary measures with the help of bank which are already on a weak situation whereas the fiscal measures taken by the government of india as compared to other countries are bigger just for name sake they are utilizing the fiscal measures at the same time they are concentrating on the bank which are already in a weak position and moreover the end reason is that there is no demand demand is not coming from the bottom line and when there is no demand there may not be any production if there is no production of course there may not be any demand from the bank side or from the bank for uh, this uh, loans and all these things so i am not wasting your time of course all of you are eager to hear from professor ram kumar anyway i just give an introduction about the situation so the situation is not at all good and a lot of things we expect from the government not only from the central government yeah according to a latest study the central as well as state government should share or they will come to the picture in the ratio of 60 is to 40 state government has to take 60 percent of the steps for revival of the economy and only 40 percent they expect from the government of india and accordingly the finance commission too had asked that the share of the 42 percent to the state government that should be increased anyway both the central and state government they have the role and it is their time or they have to do up and we need not expect from the private parties we need not look at the private parties when the demand is at the lowest level if there is demand private parties will come so when the demand is less it is the government has to act government has to create it is the time of giving not the time of taking i am totally against even salary cut of course it will reduce the purchasing power this is not the right time of course government can reduce the salary okay that is another thing but this is not the right time i personally believe that this is the time of giving not the time of taking so by providing money to the people full salary or extra salary or even government can think of sharing the wages in the unorganized sector as is being done by some of the developed countries of course all of you know that the government even though the government is paying the salary to their employees most of the private organizations even self financing college they are not paying salary because without getting money they cannot pay salary so it is the time of government to act government has to share in this uh, wages also so government has to come with more cash transfer the present cash transfer is not sufficient with the present food and so many of course uh, i am not uh, taking your time anyway almost all the sectors are affected real estate agriculture health retail uh, then uh, of course all these sectors are affected so we need a flexible labor market and a lot of steps we expect from the government so my humble request from professor r ram kumar is that of course this is the picture all we know the economy is affected what we expect from you is that so being a member of our planning board how this situation can be revived so what are the steps the state government has to take and what are the steps that the government how to take it's the central government so this is the time of action and the time of action it should come from the government not from private parties 
so without demand no private party will come for investment so government should come into picture that is my personal opinion so we expect from uh, professor ram kumar so what are the measures that the uh, government of kerala as well as central government can take of course in tune with the other countries of course globally they are taking a lot of steps so like the other countries what the steps the government as well as state government can uh, take for overcoming the present situation so i hope that you will give more stress for that kind of a a uh, revival strategy i expect uh, that kind of a lecture from professor ram kumar ram ram kumar he can give it because he is uh, in addition to an academician he is an advisory to our state government in the sense that he is a planning board member so with these words i am coming to my assigned task of welcoming all of you first of all professor ram or ram kumar ram kumar as far as professor ram, ram kumar is concerned he took msc in agriculture from national Tamil Nadu National Agriculture University, our nearby state, and later he took his PhD from Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, and then he joined. Presently, he is uh, serving as the professor of Tata Institute of Social Science, and he is a professor there in the School of Development Studies, and he has a NABARD chair. He board, as I told that, he is a member of our state planning board. You know the importance of state planning board. All the policy decisions. it is the agency which give direction to the government so he is a member so is a very good post is a very he can contribute more for the economy of our own state and he is also a visiting uh, scholar of cds in addition he is doing his post doctoral work in mexico so uh, then i had listened some of his articles and he immediately reacted to the demonetization gst and the presently the agriculture reforms all of you know that today is being of course some of the parties are call for a bend today of course three agriculture uh, reforms bill of course it was uh, due to some uh, yeah some uh, informal way it was passed even in rajya sabha so he had acted or he had expressed against these kinds of the recent steps by the government of course we have to criticize not only the central government as i told the state government too has to share in reviving the economy a lot of political controversies are there but this is not the right time along with the political controversies of course as far as kerala is concerned political controversies are there all time whether it is whatever may be the was situation so leave it along with this political controversies uh, in tune with the uh, central government the state government should also act so i expect a, that kind of a strategy that kind of policy advice from professor r ram, ram kumar with these words with most respect i welcome professor r ram kumar the resource person as well as the esteemed guest of our webinar today so warm welcome to this webinar your lecture on this impact tool covid 19 on indian economy so warm welcome to professor r ram kumar then our own faculty a well known person throughout the country dr gabriel simon tatil no need of introduction about uh, gabriel simon tatil as far as he is a proud to our department in the sense that uh he is a well known person throughout the country as well as globally he is known he is chairing some international post also and he is presently the chairman of the this one of the uh top most person in indian accounting association and as far as university is concerned he is the director of iqsc and he is the director school of business management and legal studies ebo all is a well known person throughout the country so no need of any introduction about him so on behalf of the department of commerce and on behalf of all the learned people assembled here i express a warm welcome to dr gabriel simon tatil also being the moderator of this webinar then i welcome my own faculty dr asia begum the dean faculty of commerce dr hari kumar professor uh, dr biju t associate professor uh, dr uh, biju av the program coordinator mr binu ashok then uh, miss leshmi and all the faculty members and all the research scholars a warm welcome above all of course a lot of people have joined at present one or two people are there in, so i welcome all of you individually and i hope that you can enjoy the session and with these words i am concluding i am handing over the session to dr simon tatil being the moderator sir please take over yes okay thank you uh, professor raju uh, distinguished speaker of the day professor ram kumar my colleagues in the department other faculty members researchers and students a very good evening to one and all we are all here to listen to a very hot crucial very live topic on the impact of covid 19 on the indian economy 
uh, Professor Raju has given a very, uh, I think, a very good description on uh, the impact in different sectors. Uh, we have seen unemployment growing. We have talked about reduction in production, job losses, poverty enhancing, so on and so forth continuously. And we have been reading and listening a lot on what is going to be the impact as far as the future is concerned. We are not quite sure as to how long this would prolong and when we are going to come out of this. But uh, there has been a lot of rethinking and redefining in terms of several issues, in, ter in terms of uh, the skill sets that we need, in terms of uh, revisiting the entire philosophy of globalization. We saw the Prime Minister talking about uh, uh, local, being vocal on local, and we have seen lots and lots of things of resilience and bouncing back and steps that we can do in, uh, to come back. Anyway, these are all things which we, are, uh, we have been talking over, which we have been putting our brains and minds together on policy initiatives. Uh, but what actually is in stock for us is uh, yet to be seen. But we have indicators coming up, and we have statistics coming up in terms of uh, what is in stock for the economy. We are, we are seeing signals of negative growth. And at the same time, we are saying, okay, 2021 onwards, there could be some uh, bounce back. So that will depend upon many other factors. Uh, it won't be appropriate on my part to, uh, what you call, uh, put these things together when Professor Ram Kumar is now with us with his presentation. So on uh, behalf of the Department of Commerce, University of Kerala, and on behalf of all those who are present here, specifically the researchers and students who have, or who have to rework and relook and revisit uh, their topics in terms of uh, what changes they were uh, they they kept in mind when they conceived an idea and what are their issues with which now they are uh, working on so i request uh, uh, professor ram kumar a very warm welcome to you and i over to you for your sessions thank you so much thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, for this uh, talk uh, Dr. Tatil, Dr. Raju, uh, Dr. Biju, uh, and everyone who invited me to this. I'm very privileged to be speaking to this uh, audience. Uh, I was invited to speak on this topic of uh, uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, the Indian economy. Uh, this is part of a, a paper that we had written recently, myself, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Tejal Kanitkar, uh, and uh, I shall largely base myself uh, on the major points we made in that paper. Now, uh, the first, uh, I want to start from this point that the pandemic is something that is unique, uh, not just in a historical sense, uh, but also in uh, the sense of the different theories that we have studied in uh, textbooks or other scholarly works in economics. If you look at the history of different types of economic crises, we largely see economic crises based on sometimes a demand slowdown, sometimes a supply shock, or sometimes uh, speculative activities in the financial market. These are the different, uh, uh, broadly the causes of different crises that we have seen in the recent past. But COVID-19 crisis is rather unique uh, in that it is a convergence of many of these happening simultaneously and yet autonomously. Uh, so COVID-19 crisis is at once a demand crisis, but it, at the same time, it is also a supply shock. Uh, not just a supply shock, it's also a supply chain shock. Uh, so uh, it is not very, uh, it is not very normally or usually that we see demand and supply uh, coming down together at the same time. Uh, in fact, in, even in microeconomics textbooks, you will see that uh, such a situation is categorized as a special case where prices at the end of the fall of both demand and supply together are called indeterminate. So there is no determination of prices possible. So that's there's a there's a great level of uncertainty that is there in the determination of prices, even 
uh, in a textbook scenario. Uh, so this is rather unique. This is an exogenous shock. Uh, this has led to a shrinkage of both demand and supply. And economies of any hue, uh, left, right, center, have not quite witnessed this kind of a uh, situation of this sign or address this kind of a crisis in any time in the recent past. Mm. So that is one key uh, point uh, that there is a there's a certain uniqueness to this crisis on the one hand and there is a certain uh, lack of knowledge or lack of experience uh, as to how to deal with a pandemic of this sort in the economic sense. Mm. Uh, now uh, if you look at uh, the uh, broad trends that we have uh, uh, from the time the pandemic began, you will see that there is a certain relationship between the pandemic as a health crisis and the pandemic as an economic crisis. Now, this means that if you look at the pandemic, uh, if you, uh, if you, just a second, I'll just go back to uh, my screen. Yes, if you look at the pandemic, what you will see is that uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to control the health pandemic, you may need to shut down the economy. You may need to go into lockdown and so on. Uh, so that becomes a necessity. Now, if you do lockdown, then economic activity will certainly come down. So as the, health, as the, as the pandemic uh, expands in the health sense, the pandemic in the economic sense will shrink. Uh, so, and for any revival of the economy from the trough that you may reach, any revival from that trough will require that you flatten the curve at the health on the health side. So, in order to revive the economy, you will have to control the pandemic. Otherwise, it would be difficult. So, there there is in some sense a certain interdependence between uh, the pandemic on the health side and the pandemic on the economic side. Uh, as the pandemic expands on the health side, the economy has to be shut down. And for any revival of the economy, the pandemic has to be controlled to begin with. So this becomes a very important problem uh, that we have. Uh, so this uh, means that we cannot talk of the economy and its econo and, and the economic revival uh, without talking about what is happening in the health sector. Now, uh, let me begin from there. Uh, I want to make a few points uh, uh, in, in from on the health side, and then I'll come back to quickly to the problem that we have on the economic side. Uh, if you look at the uh, way in which India has handled the pandemic at the national level, uh, there is a debate that you will see as to whether a lockdown is necessary or not. Uh, so people, opinions are rather pol polarized uh, in this sense. Uh, but in, in my view, a lockdown may be necessary to meet the immediate needs of addressing the pandemic. Uh, I do not agree with the argument that the lockdown was unnecessary and that large-scale uh, large scale testing, quarantine, and monitoring uh, would have sufficed. That's not uh, a point that I agree with. Uh, on the contrary, I believe uh, lockdown helps in slowing down the rate of infections, the rate of spread of infections. Uh, and what does it do? This slowing down time, uh, it, it slowing down, it provides time to the governments to expand health facilities, quarantine facilities, intensify testing, contact tracing and be prepared for a surge afterwards. So you use about two or three months that you have with the lockdown to ramp up your health infrastructure. And at the end of it, when the cases start increasing, just as it is increasing in Kerala now, uh, the, the uh, an economy or society should be ready to face that pandemic with adequate number of beds, doctors, nurses, quarantine centers, uh, ventilators, oxygen cylinders, etc. Uh, so this is one side. But the government should also ensure that all essential services are maintained. Firms are allowed uh, some amount of economic leeway to survive through the lockdown period. And people are provided relief and basic needs of theirs, such as food and possibly a cash transfer. So these are the things that the government has to do, uh, even as it shuts down the economy to uh, slow down the pandemic. Now, if you look at India's announcement of the national lockdown, it appeared more like a shock and awe tactic rather than part of a well thought out plan. Uh, just as the tactic means in military parlance, uh, India's lockdown was designed more to help the government achieve uh, rapid dominance over its people uh, using the force of power and leaving them, uh, as you say in the military parlance, uh, stunned, confused, overwhelmed and paralyzed. 
It was imposed without adequate warning and was not backed up by any transparent and scientifically sound statement of intent. That's the key point that I want to uh, start uh, the discussion from. But at the same time, uh, if you look at the national level, there are clearly two positives that India had. India's, positive, India's uh, action uh, sort of worked in two ways. First is uh, India uh, was largely successful in slowing down the spread of inf uh, infections for a large uh, period of time in the beginning of the pandemic. So the total number of confirmed infections per day was only about 119 at the national level when the lockdown was imposed. 23rd March. This increased to uh, uh, 18,000 by June and now it's about 90,000 and, and a lakh. So in other words, uh, if you look at March 119, uh, by April 30th, you had only 1,718 infections. Uh, 30th May, you had only about 8,000 infections. And about 30th June, you had only 19,000 infections at the national level. So March, April, May, June, you had four uh, or three and a half to four months available with you to ramp up the health infrastructure uh, uh, in the country. But did we do that? Unfortunately, the experience from states actually tell us that we have not quite been successful in ramping up health infrastructure to the extent that we should have. That means, and why am, what am I, why am I saying this? Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because uh, uh, the an early flattening of the curve is extremely important to begin reviving the economy at an early date. The later you're flattening your curve, the latter will be uh, the time when you can start reviving your economy or rather uh, ease lockdowns and open up the economy. Uh, now, as a result, India now is actually opening up the society and economy right at a time when you have not yet even seen a, a, a remote view of uh, where you are in terms of flattening the curve. So you, you basically, we have basically uh, extended the revival of the economy, delayed the revival of the economy because we did not ramp up testing in the early phases. If we had ramped up tests, testing in the early phases, then we could have uh, started uh, quarantining people and controlling the spread of infections uh, by this time. And we could have already flattened the curve by maybe about July or August. And we could have started opening up the economy by around September. That's and That unfortunately was not possible. Uh, the second positive feature in India, certainly to be, to be fair, is that Indian death rates have been very low. Uh, compared to other countries, uh, or both on a, on, a, on a quantum basis and also on a per million basis. If you compare, you, you will actually see the death rates in India are lower. There are complaints that you are actually hiding a lot of deaths and so on, but nevertheless, Indian death rates have, have been low and that's a positive. But we, as I said earlier, we, where we failed is in two measures. One, we were unable to expand testing in the uh, early phases. So the number of infections are dependent of, upon the extent of testing. The less you test, the less is our ability to de detect uh, infections. So a major concern uh, raised by public health scholars is that the extent of testing in India was lower than in other countries. In fact, it was uh, less than 100 uh, per million uh, till about the 10th of June uh, 2020. And uh, even now, it has just about crossed 500 or 600. And we should have been somewhere around 2,000 or 3,000 by this time. That is uh, one very important point. Uh, so, so as a result, what we have, we have, we are nowhere near flattening the curve as of as of today. Uh, th there are uh, there are uh, there are arguments that once the winter sets in in a month from now, you might actually see a, a second wave of infections coming up in large parts of United States and Europe. If that happens in those parts of the world, then we might also see an acceleration of cases by November and December, uh, and which might uh, spin out of control by January or February of 2021. That's a very uh, scary uh, 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 scenario that we are looking at for the early 2021. And as a result, it's quite unclear as to how the economy can be revived, as to when the economy, economic revival can even begin uh, in the uh, in the earnest so that that's that's a uh, that's a key point uh, that uh, we have to uh, remember let me come to the economy now and i, I will uh, start talking about the economy using uh, a set of slides that i would like to uh, show you uh, the, so the first point that i would like to make here uh, is the following that uh, before we start talking about the indian economy 
during COVID, it is important that we make a few statements about the growth rate of the econ economy and, uh, even prior to COVID. And here is my argument. My argument is that Indian economy was already at a weak and vulnerable position by the time the pandemic began in February or March of 2020. This is the key point that I want to argue out in the next few slides. Uh, this, I'll start from uh, uh, the basic uh, data on uh, the growth rates of gross value added. These are uh, year on year uh, the growth rates of gross value added. It's a quarterly series. Uh, and I begin from 2004 5 on the left side. Uh, and I end uh, uh, by the fourth quarter of 1920 on the right, right side. Mm. Uh, so, what do we see here? The, I have provided two series here because uh, the base year 2004 5 and 11 12 are not quite, com not quite comparable. So, the black one stops and the green one begins. That's when the base year shifts. The point is the following. You had very high growth rates of about 8 to 10% per quarter uh, in the uh, second half of the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, if you look at 2004-05 to about 2011-12, or maybe 10-11, you will see that you are growing at an average growth, except during the global financial crisis of 2008, you will actually see that we were growing at around 8 to 10% per uh, quarter. That's true per annum also. Uh, but uh, we that average growth rate uh, fell to about uh, 6 to 7% per annum uh, by the uh, first half of the second decade of the 21st century. That is between 2011-12 and about 2015-16 or 16-17. Uh, our average growth rate fell to about 6 to 7%. And then from 2016 onwards, and that's that is this point you see here, and from there onwards, from 2016 onwards, you see a precipitous decline of GBA growth rates uh, in India. Now, this uh, be, uh, decline in uh, GBA growth rate began with the demonetization exercise of November 2016, uh, complicated further by the GST reform of 2017 August, uh, uh, and then from there on. Uh, basically, the point is that if you simply look at G GVA growth rates, gross value added growth rates, the average growth rates had fallen by about two percentage points in the beginning of, uh, of the 2010s. And by the second half of the 2010s, you had actually started a journey uh, downwards. And the growth rate of the GVA prior to the uh, breakout of the pandemic, that is the Q4 of 2019-20, uh, that is January, February, March of 2020, was just about 3% in India. So even when the pandemic hit, this was a bad situation. And I want to show you some more slides as to uh, where we are uh, in terms of uh, uh, other indicators of the economy. This slide uh, may give you the indication that we started slowing down only by 2016 onwards. In fact, I'm going to argue that's not exactly true. And Indian economy probably started shrinking from 2011-12 itself. Now, wh why am I arguing so? These are showing investment rate and saving rate uh, in India. Uh, a lot of economists will uh, uh, tell you that uh, one of the one of the qualities that economists should economists should have is the ability to do a smell test. A smell test in the sense, if you see GDP growth rate or GVA growth rate rising, you should also be able to see if certain associated variables that are always associated with increasing economic growth rate are they in, in increasing alongside or not. That's a key test. So here, if you see uh, the investment rate and the savings rate began to rise from 2003 onwards in India, it reaches some kind of a peak by uh, 2009, 10, and 11. This is about 2010 and 11. And from after 2011, it begins to fall downwards. Investment rate, which was around 40%, uh, in about 2012 uh, is today uh, about 33 or 34% only. That's a 7% decline as a share of GDP uh, of the investment rate. So that journey downwards began in 2011. If you look at savings rate in the economy, that also began to decline after 2011 from about 36, 37% to about uh, 31 to 32% by uh, 2019. So investment rate, investment rate and saving rate, savings rate has begun to decline from 2011 onwards itself. That is not all. There are more indicators that I would like to show you. Uh, here, the, uh, uh, the line here in this graph will show uh, exports as a share of GDP. 
If you look at exports as a share of GDP, from around 2013 onwards, you actually see exports as a share of GDP falling from about 17% at that time uh, to about 12% by 2019. That's a huge fall of exports to GDP ratio. Uh, that's not all. If you look at the growth of merchandise exports, simple annual growth rates, if you check, you will see that uh, during uh, between 2005 and 2011, they were growing at fairly good positive levels. You can see these blue uh, bars here. But in the uh, after 2011, you will see that there were frequent negative growth rates. And also, even if they were positive, they were not more than uh, 5 or 6%. So exports have also begun to fall uh, from 2011 to 12 or, or about 12 onwards. This is another graph which shows the extent of decline. This is monthly growth rates in domestic credit supply in India. Uh, it is another indicator of how much uh, investment is taking place, but it is also a, a good indicator of what's happening in terms of economic activity in the economy. Uh, this peak that you see here is 2009. From after 2009, you will see that there is a historic fall in the growth rates of domestic credit supply in India. This is a huge fall from around uh, 25 to 26 percent. Uh, uh, growth rate per month, you actually come down to about 3% per month uh, by the end of uh, or the early part of the 2020. Uh, this is another important indicator that shows uh, that there was a decline that began even prior to 2016. So the point I'm making is this, uh, uh, investment rate, savings rate, uh, exports to GDP ratio, export growth rate, and growth rates of domestic credit supply. All of these indicators had begun to fall from 2011 itself. Though the GVA uh, appears to fall only from 2016 onwards, this is a process that had begun prior to 2016 itself. As a result, Indian economy was in a far vulnerable state compared to other economies of the world when the pandemic began. It was in a far more uh, ineffective state as, as uh, regards its ability to address or, uh, uh, or respond to the pandemic. Uh, in, in fact, uh, these are certain macro indicators that I showed you. Uh, these macro indicators also had a, a, a very important and immediate impact a rather visible impact on the way in which people uh, lived and worked as well. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next few slides. Uh, this is uh, unemployment rates in India collected by NSSO. Uh, this is somewhat discussed in the media, so I'm not going to spend time on it. Uh, in 2011-12, you had an unemployment rate of about 2.2% only. Okay, But by 2017-18, you had risen to 6.1% and about 5.8% the next year. This means that India had achieved rates of unemployment, which were one of the highest in about 45 years prior to 2017-18. Uh, so the slowdown that I'm talking about had an immediate, visible, and significant impact on the way people worked, and also how people lived. This is uh, headcount ratios of income poverty uh, in India, and particularly, I would draw, I would like to draw your attention to the rural uh, poverty rates here, which were about 25.7 percent in 2011-12, which rose to 29.6 uh, percent by 2017-18. This is a, a survey which the government has been trying to hide, not release, but it has obviously come out through different leaks of journalists. Uh, and uh, we know that rural poverty rates and overall poverty rates fell, uh, sorry, rose significantly between 2011-12 and 2017-18. So it was a so the period of between 2011-12 and uh, the beginning of the pandemic was uh, was uh, was uh, extremely adverse in terms of its impact on how people lived, how people worked, as along with the different macro indicators of the economy related to investment, savings, export, credit supply, etc., that we have seen till now. Now, why is it that this happened? So if you have a slowdown like this, the governments across the world would react to it, would react to it with counter-cyclical fiscal policy. Now, uh, if there was a counter, if, if the government had uh, had sort of uh, recognized the slowdown early enough, it would have uh, responded with a counter cyclical fiscal policy. Did that happen in India? This graph tells you it's 
not the case at all because in 2008 to 10 uh, by around 2010 uh, your uh, the central government's expenditure to gdp ratio uh, that is the central government's expenditure as a share of the gdp was about 16.1 percent this is the time that the slowdown began now however after the slowdown began instead of rising the expenditure of the central government as a share of the gdp has actually fallen very sharply from about 16.1 uh, in 2010 to about 12.2 by 2018-19, though it slow, slowly rose further to 13.2 in 2019-20. So counter-cyclical fiscal policy was completely absent during this period. The government was continuously trying to control its fiscal deficit. The government is trying to reduce the debt GDP ratio, and, and there was an enormous compression in the spending power of the government in this period. There was also a fall in the total central transfers to states. As a result, states' expenditure has also fallen. And uh, this is this what what this did. This absence of a countercyclical policy. In fact, not even the absence of a countercyclical policy. It's like a cyclical fiscal policy. What it did actually was to exacerbate the conditions of slowdown that existed in the Indian economy after 2011-12. Uh, government simply did not react to the uh, to the slowdown. But this is where we were. Uh, uh, by the uh, beginning of 2020 or the beginning of the, uh, or the, the time when the pandemic hit us. Now, obviously, it is time to come to the impacts uh, of uh, the pandemic on the Indian economy. Now, if you look at this graph, this is a graph released by IMF, you will very clearly see uh, that if you take the second quarter of uh, April, uh, 2020 in India, that is April to June, uh, uh, that is Q2, uh, uh, April, June is Q2 for United States, but it's Q1 for India. Uh, and uh, for many countries which have an annual financial year, uh, January to uh, December, unlike India, which has April to uh, March. Uh, so April to June is Q1 for India, but it's Q2 for other countries. That's why it's Q2 uh, written at the top. This is released by the IMF, but uh, months are the same. It is indeed April to June quarter. Uh, you will see that the Indian economy uh, this is not projection. This is actual CSO data. Indian economy uh, on a comparable basis with most other countries of the world is the economy that shrunk the fastest. This was the country which had a monstrous lockdown, but without any concomitant uh, economic package by the government or uh, some kind of uh, uh, any any major intervention by the government to, uh, to keep economic uh, growth rates high. Now, not high, but economic growth rates manageable. Uh, as a result, India, uh, Indian economy in that quarter shrank by minus 25.6%, which is the highest or largest shrinkage for any country in the world. United States, you can see here, uh, shrank by minus 9.1%. China actually expanded by 12.3% during this time because China had, by, by March, China had uh, successfully contained uh, uh, the pandemic uh, to the Hubei province, uh, where Wuhan is, and it did not uh, allow to spread it outside. So the rest of the economy rather was rather uh, normally functioning during that time, even though there was a lockdown. Uh, so China has escaped this whole uh, story of shrinkage, but every other country had negative, but India had the highest negative growth rate uh, uh, for uh, this period. So Indian economy has clearly been the most affected. Let us come to different sectors. If you come to different sectors, you will see that agriculture was one of the sectors which was most significantly affected. Now, uh, how did agriculture get affected in India? A, there are three or four ways in which I can summarize the whole uh, story there. The first is that uh, when the lockdown was announced, uh, the Rabi, har the, the two agricultural seasons of India being Kharif and Rabi, uh, the Rabi harvest of India was uh, beginning uh, in the northern states of India, like Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, etc. At this time, however, farmers faced a huge problem of labor shortage because it was largely migrant agricultural workers who took care of harvesting operations in crops like wheat, maize, etc. Um, at that time, uh, during this during these months, they traveled from the eastern states of Bihar, Odisha, uh, uh, Assam, West Bengal, etc. They traveled right all uh, all the way to the Punjab, Haryana, and Western UP to come the harvesting operations. Uh, this labor was not available. As a result, farmers had enormous difficulties in harvesting the rabi uh, crop on time. 
that became the most important problem uh, to begin with. Uh, and they had to sometimes spe uh, spend, uh, if, if the rent on tractors was about uh, 2,000 rupees per hour, uh, in prior to the pandemic, after the lockdown began, the uh, rent of tractors went up to about 4,000 rupees per hour. That is it doubled. So uh, the harvesting costs of farmers really went up. The second pro problem that emerged in agriculture was that there was a complete breakdown of supply chains. Even though agriculture was treated as an essential sector, uh, the, the, the uh, movement of goods, logistics sector, transport sector, all of that came to some kind of a standstill. International trade almost stopped. Ports were closed down as uh, uh, there, there were no ships flying, uh, there were no loading and loading workers in the ports, etc. So international trade was shut down. If you come to domestic trade, you will see that most of the uh, 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 the, the uh, markets were closed down. Uh, in fact, a lot of these APMC markets, which are in use now for different reasons, uh, were shut down because traders would make a testing positive on a large scale. Uh, even if they were open, APMC Mondays were open only for about two days a week or so. Uh, trucks were not available because in May, about 500,000 500, trucks were stuck in different highways of India. Uh, if trucks were av available, truck drivers were not available. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, the, the usual itinerant traders who come to villages to buy the farmers' crops, they did not come to uh, the villages. So all these resulted in a situation where uh, the farmer was unable to find adequate market for uh, his or her uh, sale of the harvest. And I did a small exercise of which the uh, results are here. I basically looked at the total market arrivals in agricultural markets of India, about uh, 2,000 to 2,200 agricultural markets of India between two dates, March 15 and June 30th. This is the time when the lockdown was then. After June 30th, the harvests have ended, so I don't need to take a period more than June, June 30th. So if you take 2019, March 15 to June 30, and 2020, March 15 to June 30, and compare the market arrivals between these two years, you will see to what extent did market arrivals decline uh, as uh, opposed to uh, uh, 2019. You will hear there are 15 crops given, and you will see that some of the major rabi crops of the time, if you, took, if you look at wheat, uh, the arrivals in 2020 were only 61.6% .6 of the total market arrivals of 2019. That is a very important point that we need to note. Uh, the, the wheat being the most important rabi crop, uh, you will see this. Uh, paddy does not show that, right? Because uh, uh, the, to begin with, it's not a major rabi crop, but also it was largely located in southern states, which, which, which managed the pandemic much better. But you will see in wheat, which is largely a northern phenomenon, uh, uh, the arrivals were only about 62% of the arrivals of 2019. Go down, if you look at gram, it's only about 38%. Barley, about 53%. PGNP, about 46%. Lentil was okay, but if you look at potato, it was only 52%. If you look at onion, it was only 38%. If you look at cauliflower and cabbage, 65 and 58%. If you look at peas, it was about uh, 42%. Uh, if you look at uh, um, uh, banana was largely all right, but lady's finger was about 73% and mango was about 43%. So you can see that uh, the market arrivals of a large majority of crops were somewhere between 60 to 70% of the market arrivals of 2019. What happened to the rest of the crops uh, which did not arrive this time? They may either have been destroyed somewhere, they may either have been sold to some informal channel and that's not recorded here at a very low price and price is something that I will come to now. Uh, you will see that uh, this decline of market arrivals would have led to a major income loss to the farmer. That is the second point. The first point was rise in rabi harvest costs. The second is a decline of uh, rabi sale uh, income from rabi sales. That is the second important point that I wanted to mention. Now, one would have understood if this was happening at the same prices like, uh, as last time. But however, if you, uh, I'm not showing that slide here because there'll be too much of uh, uh, there'll be too many slides there. Uh, but I have uh, that in my paper, uh, which was published in the Review of Agrarian Studies. All the detailed graphs are given there. You can go and see that. Uh, you will see that the prices received by farmers during this time actually fell in a large majority of crops, particularly crops like wheat, 
crops like vegetables and crops like mango. You will actually see that there was a sharp decline of farmers' prices in this time. So less market arrivals was combined with lower prices also. That's like a double whammy. So this caused enormous losses to the farmer uh, during this time. This is the first uh, sectoral point that I want to make. Agriculture was severely affected during this time. A lot of uh, discussion happens as to how agriculture can be the engine of revival for the economy, but I do not believe in that argument. I have contested that in a in a in a uh, an article in the Hindu uh, two weeks back, where I wrote that it's a flawed claim to argue that uh, uh, agriculture can be the engine of revival because it has led to enormous amount of income losses to farmers in India. That's first the uh, point about agriculture. Let us come to industry. If you see this, this is monthly uh, data on index of industrial production in India. The the the, the orange one at the top is the uh, numbers for 2019, and the, this rather gray line is about uh, I, I index of industrial production in 2020. Uh, uh, data is available till June now. You will actually see that there was a huge fall in the index of industrial production from by from about uh, uh, 134 in February to 53.6 by April, 89.5 in May, and in June also it has come to only 107.8. And it has a long way to go before it catches up with uh, the figures of 2019 or even the figures of February 2020 itself. So uh, index of industrial production is likely, if the trend continues, it is likely to catch up only by August, which is about Q2, uh, end of Q2 that we are talking about. So as a result, we are likely to see a negative growth rate of GVA, not just in Q1, but also in Q2, which is going to come. I'll show you some uh, analysis that we did in a little while, but this is the data that you see of, on the index of industrial production. Now, there are a large number of surveys that you have seen uh, of uh, FICI, of different agencies, etc. And one key point that comes out of these uh, surveys is the following. About 35% of the companies in India, which Fiki surveyed, are unlikely to open even after the pandemic. Okay, that is a key result from these, uh, you, which you uniformly get from all these surveys. About 35% uh, of the firms are unlikely to ever open again. They have been permanently closed or shut down. Another 30, and this is particularly true also of small and marginal enterprises. Now, if you take uh, the, the next category, that is the next 35% of the uh, firms are those which can be saved with some amount of help given to them. Now, if, th if that help does not uh, uh, come or is not forthcoming in the next two, one or two months, they are also likely to close down. In other words, what we are staring at is the possibility if we don't intervene appropriately and in time is that about 70% of our companies in the industrial sector are likely to close down for a, at, on, uh, close down permanently by uh, August or September uh, uh, of this. As we, we are already in uh, September now. So this is likely to be a very important possibility. And that's something that we should be wary about. Uh, uh, other data also uh, are very, uh, very uh, disturbing, so to say. I looked at three sets of indicators. One is GST collection. The other is railway traffic uh, in India in terms of uh, freight that is moved. And third is exports in India. So if you look at uh, the total collection of GST in India, you will see that's a precipitous fall that has happened. Uh, uh, during this period, uh, if even in August of uh, 2020, you have not yet reached anywhere close to the GST figures of 2019. And if you look at the cumulative loss of GST from March to uh, August of 2020, I, I, I have calculated that it is about 2 lakh crore rupees in India, It is which is the uh, likely permanent loss of GST uh, uh, collections uh, during this period. This loss is likely to continue. As you can see, the gray line has no uh, intention to stand up and grow up again. It's falling from 90,000 to 87,000 to 86,000 in August. So it is actually not rising anywhere, uh, anytime soon. And if the decline continues, you are likely to have uh, uh, end up with a loss of about four to five lakh crores in GST uh, collections uh, in 2020, and which is likely to result in a very major loss of government revenues and 
possibility of investing or spending that money in the economy. That's one. The second point is uh, what is happening to railway traffic in India of major commodities through the uh, Indian railways. Now, here there is some scope. We, in the railway traffic of July is actually was actually very close to the railway traffic of uh, uh, July 2019. And that there is some hope here uh, that the railway freight is uh, slowly picking up, but it's not quite clear whether it will fall again, but it appears to be catching up with the 2019 figure. But exports are not catching up as yet because exports, as you see in this now in this figure, uh, are still much lower than 2019. And uh, yeah, the figure for August has not come yet, but we are still quite far away from 2019 figures. And this is going to be another important loss, uh, avenue of loss for India. So GST, railway freight, uh, uh, exports, all these have, do not uh, show any sign of major revival that is reaching back to the 2019 levels as yet. Now, uh, a key, uh, what is more important uh, is actually how it has affected the levels of unemployment in India. Uh, in, if you're, in fact, if you look, uh, these are CMI figures uh, of labor force and uh, employment and unemployment monthly between February and August of 2020, you will actually see that the total labor force, look at total employed persons in India. There were about 40 crore employed people in India in 2020 uh, February. This 40 crore fell to 28 crore in April, 30 crore in May, 37 crore uh, uh, in June, 39 crore in July, and August it has come very close back to the 20 February 2020 levels. People have uh, have been unable to remain unemployed. They were they were they were, uh, they were uh, uh, affected by hunger, lack of food, lack of income, etc. And as a result, people have simply gone out to get some of the other kind of work. Uh, most of these uh, jobs. Uh, CMI shows are poorly uh, are poorly paid and poorly skilled jobs. So people are not quite look, looking at uh, people not people are not being choosy about the kind of jobs they want. They're doing whatever jobs come their way. So as a result, the unemployment rate appears to be slowly declining, uh, even back to the February 2020 levels. But the earnings of people are unlikely to. Uh, 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 rise. In fact, CMI surveys actually show that the annual, sorry, the uh, average monthly income of a household in India uh, through their surveys, which was around 20,000 before the pandemic, uh, has come down to about 12,500 after the pandemic. So there is a decline of uh, uh, household income or the month, or monthly household income by about 8,000 to 9,000 rupees after the pandemic began. And that's the kind of shrinkage that you witness in the economy. So there, there, there's a huge shrinkage of uh, uh, employment. Uh, in fact, if you see the levels of unemployment for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe groups was actually far higher than the unemployment rate for uh, the economy. This might uh, give you the impression that only casual employment was affected and skilled salaried employment uh, was not affected. But data actually also shows CMI data itself shows that about two to three crore salary jobs have also been lost in India during the pandemic that took probably permanently. So that is another important uh, uh, problem that you see uh, in the way the economy has been uh, moving. Uh, now, this actually takes me to a small exercise that I want to uh, share uh, uh, share to you. And this is uh, about a small uh, uh, an, a analysis of uh, input output analysis that I would like to show you. Uh, I would just uh, ask you for a for a two second thing. I would like to shift to a particular slide. Uh, I would like to uh, show you something uh, uh, now from a small analysis that we did. Okay, here it is. Now, the point I want to make uh, is the following. Uh, I, uh, we also uh, uh, did a small exercise uh, as part of our work, uh, which was an input-output analysis uh, 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 sort of framework. Uh, basically, we moved out from uh, the usual projections that are made by different uh, rating agencies and so on, which largely make use of computable general equilibrium modeling uh, to look at uh, uh, the uh, impacts on the economy. Uh, we sort of moved to a slightly different model here. So uh, most of the uh, modeling, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the professor who introduced me 
spoke about the Fitch uh, uh, projections and so on. Most of these projections that you see uh, are uh, you have used either prevailing economic models or uh, some computable general equilibrium models, which largely end up being uh, 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 capturing, being able to capture only the direct impacts of the lockdown, direct economic losses due to the lockdown. Uh, now they uh, actually uh, range from about. 8% uh, to 9% at the minus level for India. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 the, the, the estimates differ widely. Some people show about minus 11%, minus 12%. Some others show minus 4%, minus 5%. Uh, they're largely due to certain assumptions that they make. Uh, but we try to move away from these models. What we try to do is we use an input output model, uh, which as you all know, as students of economics, uh, we are able to compute not just direct economic losses as in computable general equilibrium models, we are able to also uh, look at uh, indirect impacts of the economy. Uh, uh, and which, because we are able to better capture informal sector, number one, we are also able to better capture uh, intersectoral uh, impacts. Uh, of uh, the changes in one sector. Changes in one sector affect another sector also. That uh, is becomes possible to be captured in an input-output framework, but it is not possible in a uh, computable general equilibrium fr framework. The computable general equilibrium frameworks of the neoclassical variety, uh, uh, they use uh, uh, typical neoclassical assumptions of perfectly rational agents uh, transacting within markets that actually allow a large degree of substitution between inputs, capital and labor. So they typically consist of a large set of uh, non-linear production functions. And these functions are largely sensitive to parametric assumptions that we make and provide an overall result without transparently examining the relationship between uh, uh, one sector and another sector or between sectors that result in an estimated economic outcome. So what is it that we have to tell you about our economic, I'm not uh, going to the, uh, to the details of the modeling exercise because that would be uh, not appropriate for an occasion like this, but I would like to uh, show you our major results here. Uh, basically, what, does a, what, what are we doing in, in the input output modeling? Uh, we are basically taking uh, uh, a situation. What is our baseline? The baseline is a situation where uh, if 2021 was an year, uh, was a year in which there was no pandemic, what would the output, uh, what would the output have been? Okay, that's number one. And if the pandemic is uh, factored into the model, and that uh, factoring in, in, in factoring the pandemic into the model is largely through uh, the number of lockdown days, and so you compute a certain number of labor days lost in work, and you use the uh, uh, variable of number of labor days lost to assess the total uh, uh, amount of uh, GDP or GVA lost in the economy. That's a very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a classical tool, but I think uh, the coming in of computable general equilibrium models have led to uh, a demise of this kind of modeling exercises, but I think we need to bring it back because they capture both direct and indirect impacts. So if you see uh, the growth rate of uh, the different scenarios that we give here are the number of uh, uh, lockdown days. So scenario one means in 2021, 31 days are lost. Scenario two means 40 days are lost. Scenario three means 53 days are lost. And scenario four means uh, 70 days are lost. Uh, more than two months are lost. If you take that 70 days loss, which I think we are somewhere between scenario three and four uh, in uh, India. And I think if you, if you take this, we are actually looking at the GDP growth rates in 2021, not one quarter or two quarters, but the full 2021 uh, uh, financial year, we expect that India's economic growth rate in 2020-21 will be somewhere between minus 15 and minus 21%. This is one estimate that we have put out. Uh, uh, many rating agencies have actually shown that this is likely to be maybe minus 8, minus 10, minus 11%, but we actually think it will be far more when the GDP data of 2021 come out. Uh, we will actually probably see that it was far uh, wider and greater in impact. Uh, minus 15 to minus 20 percent is likely to be uh, the growth rate of the economy in 2021 in India. That is an estimate that we uh, put out. Now, what is now we come to the role of the government. Uh, the uh, uh, the professor who introduced me uh, especially mentioned the point about what the government should do. Now this. Uh, uh, is the uh, uh, section into which I enter now. Uh, uh, this is uh, the RBI surveys on the index of current economic situation in India. The last one, 
if this is these are all three month periods. So three months beginning in March, three months beginning in May, and three months beginning in July. That means July, August, September. That this is what the fifty three point eight number would mean. So the index of a current economic situation, not future, current economic situation uh, in the three months beginning from July was nowhere showing as any sign of revival in India. It it, it shows that. Uh, uh, it is a very bad situation with respect to current economic situation. Now, if I go to the future economic situation, the picture becomes even bleaker, right? That is, uh, even for a future economic expectation, the value for the three months period beginning in July was far lower than 29. So people are not industrialists, uh, businessmen, uh, firms, they are not seeing any prospect of an immediate economic revival in India, uh, at least till about September or October. Gupta. That's where the sound is coming. Yeah, now it's okay, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, so let me, uh, I'm sorry, I, I hope you were able to hear uh, till the last point that I made. Uh, I was trying to say that uh, even even if if you consider future economic uh, uh, expectations, you are far, uh, we are in a far poorer state in uh, uh, July, August, September of 2020 as compared to 2019. Now, this brings me to the question of what the government should do. If you look at it globally, you will see the following phenomenon. About seven to ten trillion dollars is what different countries have set aside for economic revival packages. And if you examine this uh, seven to ten trillion dollars, you will see that somewhere between 40 to 45 percent of these uh, packages uh, the size of these packages are actually direct fiscal measures, what IMF calls as above the line, okay, which are directly spend, spent from the budget of the government. And the remaining 60% or 55% uh, is amount that is promised through banks and other financial institutions in the form of loans, uh, uh, credit guarantees, etc. These constitute the remaining 60%. So about 40% is direct fiscal uh, measures and 60% is monetary measures, that, uh, what is called as below the line measures by IMF. Uh, in India, if you see, India has uh, India uh, announced a package in the end of uh, March, a small package, uh, then um, uh, which was called the Pradhan Mandri Garib Kalyan Yojana. And by in the end of May 2020, they uh, uh, announced what is called as the Atmanirbhar package. At the end of all these packages, it is claimed that the total economic revival package in India is about of the size of about rupees 20 lakh crore. And this rupees 20 lakh crore amounts to about 10% of the GDP. And hence, we have an economic package which is comparable to the economic packages of most other developed countries like United Kingdom or United States or Germany, etc. This is the argument of the government. Now, this, however, uh, a simple examination of uh, uh, the measures of the central government, as you can show, as you can see uh, in this uh, in this uh, graph, uh, is actually faulty. This kind of claim is actually flawed, uh, primarily because if you uh, carefully uh, uh, sort of filter out what is above the line and what is below the line uh, in the Indian government budgets, you will actually see that uh, you can see the last row here, measures with direct bearing on the government budgets or deficits is only about 1.5% of the GDP uh, within this total, total size of 10% of the GDP as is claimed for the package as a whole. So only 1.5% of the GDP and not 10% of the GDP is actually the actual spending of the government in the economy. If you look at it uh, uh, on a percentage basis, if globally countries have spent about 40% of their budgets on direct fiscal measures in India, that 40% has become about 5% only. That is the key point that I want to make. Even if I really use a liberal view of what it is, I can maximum take it up to 15.4%. 
Okay. Now, 15.4% is a maximum I can take it to, uh, even if I use a completely liberal measure. Uh, but uh, in my view, it is not even 15, it is about 5%, uh, somewhere between 5 and 10%. And uh, it is far inadequate compared to the global estimates of uh, packages that we have. Uh, that is the first point that I want to make. The second point I want to make is this, that if I look at India's COVID stimulus package as a percentage of the GDP uh, and actually compare it on the uh, y-axis here, what is it called? It is called the stringency index. That's a stringent, stringent, stringency index is used uh, globally as an indicator of how strict your lockdown is. Okay, uh, what clearly comes out is India had one of the strictest lockdowns anywhere in the world. Look at the vertical axis. India is here. I'll tell you what India 1, 2, and 3 are, but it is on par with what was in Spain, which was one of the hotspots uh, globally. Uh, but, but at the same time, if you see the size of stimulus package and the share of the GDP, you will see that in, this is India's 20 lakh crore. That if you look at it, then India looks like it is on the right side. But if you actually look at the size of the package without liquidity measures, India moves leftwards uh, to about 5%. And if I look only at direct spending, uh, which is about 1 to 1.5 lakh crore out of rupees 20 lakh crore, then you are somewhere here. And I think this is where India really is. Okay, So it had one of the strictest lockdowns, but one of the smallest economic revival packages. This is what comes out very clearly from the Indian experience. In fact, if you look at Japan, but Japan has a package of which is about 22% of the GDP. Okay, Sweden has about 13% of the GDP. United States is about 13.5% of the GDP. Right? Whereas India, at best, you can put that put them here at India too, which is uh, removing the liquidity measures. You are at about 5% uh, of the GDP at best, and not. Uh, which is half of what is claimed, uh, which is 10% of the GDP. So Indian uh, stimulus package has been one of the smallest in the world, while its lockdown was one of the strictest in the world. This is the key uh, point that comes out. Now that uh, brings me to uh, um, uh, the points that I want to make now, which is uh, related to the, what is to be done and so on. Uh, now, the key point here is one of the questions that has been raised is, how will India raise the resources? Uh, for a stimulus package. So one, the point, the first point I want to make is India needs an urgent large revival package. Number one, uh, the question that arises very, uh, very uh, normally uh, is uh, where will the money come from? Where will the resources come from? Uh, in my view, there can be three major sources of this revival package, uh, uh, finances for this revival package. I'm talking only of fiscal package now. The first, you need to borrow more. Uh, in fact, uh, our banks in India are flush with liquidity at this point of time, and it is time that the government is able to tap those resources and increase borrowings. That's number one. And this is not the time where you have to be worried about rise in fiscal deficits. This is the time to raise fiscal deficits because globally, I'm telling you globally, fiscal deficits are going to rise phenomenally. Uh, in this year. Uh, you can be fairly sure that the fiscal deficit and deficits as a share of the GDP at the global level will be somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the GDP in 2021. And India cannot hope to keep it at 3 percent as is uh, uh, determined in the fiscal responsibility legislations uh, and yet try to revive the economy. India cannot remain stingy in this era when globally uh, people are freeing up their purses and raising the fiscal deficit to keep the economy afloat. That's number one. This, you need to borrow more. The second point is that India needs to tap the old route of monetization of deficits that you followed till about 1997. Monetization of the deficit is a fairly legitimate and clear-cut way and simple way of increasing expenditure in the economy, which we should make use of during this time of crisis. Globally, capitalist countries are freely making use of this pathway in order to raise resources for the revival packages. So monetization of the deficit is another method that we should actively uh, use. Uh, there is also an effort to be made, that is third point, where uh, you, you need to uh, look at avenues of taxation, which uh, does not uh, uh, adversely affect enterprises, very very clearly so, but at the same time, uh, try to ensure that wherever you have some of the super rich making super profits, 
you are you try to uh, bring in some amount of regulation some amount of taxation for example in wealth tax inheritance tax etc and try to uh, fetch more revenues that's another way in which you should try to expand uh, your uh, resources so borrowing monetization monetization of the deficits and taxation these are the three measures that you should very clearly use to uh, expand spending in the economy now uh, uh, this uh, brings me to the last point and i oh, and i was not uh, uh, going to say it uh, 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 the uh, the moderator wanted me to say something about what is happening in the kerala economy as well and i shall uh, uh, try to make a few comments uh, on uh, that now uh, the key point about kerala is that it was one of the first states in india to uh, announce a, an economic revival package uh, kerala uh, announced an economic revival package of uh, about 20000 crore in the middle of march itself before anybody else uh, had announced any such package so uh, that was one key important point uh, uh, in kerala if you look at kerala one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, directions that the chief minister directly gave to people like us uh, is that nobody should die of hunger nobody should suffer from hunger during the lockdown period that was a very clear uh, message given uh, uh, from the from right at the top so if you see the uh, uh, composition of the 20 thousand crore package in kerala you will actually see that and there's a great uh, uh, effort to ensure that uh, the uh, the the conditions in which people live uh, is tolerable uh, they get enough food they get enough resources during the lockdown uh, and that was that is one of the big focuses of the uh, economy uh, so if you look at uh, 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 the most important uh, relief measure of the government during this time, it was through the social security pension route. Uh, social security pensions were front loaded uh, uh, in Kerala and we, our estimates are, you know, let me put it this way. Uh, the uh, professor, welcome, welcome, professor Raju who welcomed us asked me to speak about the planning board activities as well. Uh, so here is a summary. Uh, when uh, we when we uh, uh, took over in about 2016, uh, the total number of beneficiaries of social security pensions in India was rupees uh, was 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 33 to 34 lakh people. That was the total number of beneficiaries in 2016. Today, in 2020, the total number of beneficiaries of social security pensions in Kerala have risen from 34 lakh in 2016 to 58 lakh beneficiaries. That is almost doubling of the number of beneficiaries of social security pensions in Kerala. Uh, during the uh, pandemic, what we also did was we tried to front load all social security pensions. So first, uh, we decided to give all, uh, the previous five months pension in the month of April, then we give May and June in June, and then June, July, August now. So about seven months to eight months of pension was uh, put into the hands of people in Kerala using the economic revival package. And as a result, our calculations show that one beneficiary or one household in Kerala is likely to have received on an average about rupees 6,000 during the period of the pandemic. Uh, uh, from the government of Kerala. That is one uh, important way in which the Kerala government tried to support the people of uh, the state. The second important way is through ensuring the essential services like food. You are well aware that of the expansion of the PDS network in Kerala during this period and uh, about uh, uh, 14 lakh 78 thousand BPL and Anthudia uh, so, uh, households. Uh, sorry, one, 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 one additional point I want to mention here, which is I said the total number of beneficiaries of social security pensions rose from uh, 34 lakh to 58 lakh. That's one. But there are a lot of people without social security pensions, right? Uh, uh, the, the, what the government did was to put together a database of 14 lakh to 15 lakh people uh, who need social security pension but are outside the social security pension cover and provided them with one with 1000 rupees per month okay that is an additional payment uh, which was made uh, to people uh, during the pandemic so it was like a cash transfer of 1000 rupees per household in addition to social security pensions that's the second important thing uh, then you will see uh, uh, 15 kilograms of food grains given free uh, to households uh, along with uh, 
uh, atta and other commodities which are required for the kitchen. Uh, you also see community kitchens opened up in a big way using decentralization as an instrument. Uh, you also see uh, food packets being given. Uh, free. Uh, some of the food kits uh, make you really uh, uh, make make you really uh, feel very amused because uh, the packet itself costs about one thousand to one thousand five hundred rupees. It has a variety of uh, uh, essential items for the household which are enough for a month, and uh, uh, that is yet another way in which the state government was able to intervene in the economy. So you will see different ways, uh, ensuring food security, uh, ensuring uh, that uh, uh, people have some amount of cash with them uh, through the period of lockdown. These have been the focus measures of the Kerala government's economic package. Uh, Kerala government is also, Kerala is also the only state in India which has an urban employment guarantee program. And that is something that you nationally require now. Uh, it is called the Ayankali uh, Urban Employment Guarantee Program, uh, which provides employment to a large number of people in the urban areas. So it's still a small scheme, not a big scheme, but it makes has an enormous amount of promise. So these are the Kerala government interventions. Uh, uh, members of SSGs, uh, all SSG, women SSGs in India, being given uh, uh, loans of about 500 crore. That is yet another part of the package. So I'm not going into each one of them, but this is the fo broad focus. Come back to national level, and I'll close my presentation here, uh, which is the following. Uh, what do you need at the national level? What you need at the national level is urgently, as the lockdown is being lifted, you need a very major fiscal stimulus in the economy. Now, earlier, when the lockdown was in place, uh, this was not a possibility, because even if you put money into the hands of people, they may not spend it because supply chains are still broken because the lockdown is still in place. They may simply end up saving it and not spending it. So the, it will not have an, any impact in a multiplier sense of the word. Uh, so what we need now, now that lockdown is being lifted, slowly, uh, we need to put money into the hands of people so that demand in the economy can be raised significantly. That is the key point that we need to focus on. How do you raise demand? You can, of course, put money, simply transfer money into the bank accounts of people, but that's not uh, uh, the best way to do it, in my view. You can actually create enormous amounts of economic assets through using your uh, NREGS and also starting an urban employment guarantee program at the national level. Raising the levels of employment is the best and the most sustainable way to increase demand in the economy at this point of time. Uh, and I think this has to be taken up uh, on a war footing. You need to double the size of NREGS. You need to introduce an urban employment guarantee program. Uh, that is not enough. You need to provide firms in different sectors with sectoral packages. Why are sectoral packages important? Sectoral packages are important because there is, look at, for example, a sector like poultry. Okay, the total loss in the poultry sector is to the extent of rupees 25,000 crore. And that is actually an estimate of two months prior now. Uh, it would have even further increased now. So this, you need a special package for dairy sector where milk prices at the national level has fallen from rupees 35 per liter to about rupees 20 per liter for milk farmers. Okay. That's a loss that they are suffering. Uh, so, so you need sectoral packages for dairies, sectoral packages for uh, 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 livestock, that is poultry. You also need sectoral packages in sectors like small and medium enterprises. Uh, globally, if you see, uh, if you look at the furlough schemes of the United Kingdom and so on, you will see that something like 80%, remember, 80% of uh, uh, the uh, wage costs of different uh, of the small and medium enterprises uh, in countries like the united kingdom are being paid uh, by the uh, government of uh, united kingdom uh, to these firms if they keep all the workers in their payroll so provided they don't dismiss anybody the government pays firms about 80 percent of the wage costs in india you haven't even gone anywhere near such a program right you, you, there are limitations in, uh, to, to do the, exactly the same thing in India, but you haven't even tested it in any, any, in any sector. So small and medium enterprises need a major financial assistance program of that sort. And I do not think that you can live with simply asking them to go to the bank and borrow more. I do not think that will happen. I do not think there is enough demand in the economy to generate an increase in credit supply. I don't think that's a sustainable route. The only sustainable route is to put money directly into the hands of people on the one hand and firms on the other.
that is the best way to re revive the economy. But and unfortunately, the current uh, fiscal stance of the government appears to be highly unsatisfactory in terms of the possibilities of reviving demand in the economy. And as a result, I remain highly pessimistic about uh, how and when the economic, Indian economy will start reviving. Our estimate of minus 15 to minus 20 percent is quite scary. If that happens, uh, even 21, 22, uh, the financial year 21, 22 is also likely to be uh, very uh, bad for the economy. So I would stop it here and I would just say that the, the India urgently need a, a, a huge stimulus package um, uh, for the economy. And that's the only way to revive the economy from the pr present morass that it is in. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Ram Kumar, for your wonderful presentation on impact, which was filled with uh, data and facts on what happened in the past, and also talking about uh, what are the measures that we could probably do in order to salvage the economy and see that it is back on the rails. I'll just quickly uh, sum up what uh, Professor Ram Kumar has presented, and then we can perhaps uh, come on to the question and answer se session. Professor Ram Kumar rightly started off with uh, this pandemic being unique in terms of supply and demand. He talked about the health crisis vis-a-vis -vis the economic crisis. And again, he said that uh, the backing that the government had in terms of looking at health infrastructure and perhaps flattening the curve was not uh, at the desired pace. Then he went on to look at the economic uh, growth that was uh, taking place and he said uh, India was vulnerable uh, even before the pandemic had its uh, face uh, set on. We were not doing well. And in, in terms of economic growth, on terms of gross value added, we started showing a negative, uh, sorry, we started showing a, a, a slower growth rate right from 2016. And based on the smell test, we were not doing very well from 2011-12 onwards in terms of investment rate, savings rate, in terms of employment, in terms of poverty, and so on and so forth. He also has uh, clearly po pointed out uh, the impact in terms of the agriculture sector where arrivals and in terms of value there has been a decline uh, during the pandemic period. And in the industrial sector, what is very uh, painful is uh, the fact that he has pointed out in terms of data from Wiki saying that 70% uh, of all firms would face problems and if salvaged, perhaps 35 can uh, come up and 35 is always going to get uh, closed down. And he was uh, trying to bring out their own analysis, which says that we have we are in a very uh, uh, in a very bad state for 21, 22, where on the basis of input output analysis, uh, there could be a decline in economic growth rate by 15 to 20 percent, even in 21, 22, which means figures for the future are not very promising. And in fact, it is uh, something which is going to be a, a gray area. Now, as a part of the revival, that was something which is very interesting. He has talked about three key factors. One is borrow more, two, monetization of deficit, and the third one is taxation, where you need to have some sort of taxation policies for taxing the rich in terms of wealth tax and inheritance tax and so on. He also touched upon the uh, Kerala uh, fiscal measures that have come up and what actually should happen in terms of the fiscal re revival package, where we have... Uh, now, although we are talking about 10% of the GDP, it is hardly 1.4% of the GDP. And we need to do a lot to enhance it and to see that we have a fiscal, uh, a fiscal, uh, fiscal measures in place to see that we uh, achieve this. So for that, uh, he said, uh, employment guarantee scheme, giving more money and uh, even your borrowing more. Fiscal deficit is not always a dirty word. It, it has to be looked into. So this is what was the summary of what was being uh, put across. Uh, now, before we start off, I'll just, as a moderator, I think two things uh, I, I'll just share. And uh, after that, we'll open up for the uh, audience to raise their question. So in your presentation, you were very, uh, very specifically saying that uh, the, the decline in the growth rate started in 2016 and its indicators in terms of investment rate, in terms of savings rate, in terms of uh, poverty, employment, it all started happening in 2011-12. Uh, Would you attribute this to anything, any specific reason as why why this 11-12 started showing the signs of uh, decline? 
uh, number one. And uh, this is one thing which I would like to uh, get some light on. And the second part would be uh, when you talked about Kerala, you said uh, you were referring to the social security measures, the poverty elevation measures, and how uh, welfare measures in terms of all the, the, the pension schemes and other things were revived. Uh, what, what actually will be the impact uh, as far as Kerala is concerned in terms of agriculture and industry and more specifically services uh, uh, in, in the years to come? So these are two things which I would uh, quickly uh, like to get uh, your response and after which we will be opening up to the uh, all the uh, members of the participants to raise your priority. Uh, quickly, uh, your response onto this, Professor Ram Kumar, and after which uh, the other participants. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Simon, uh, for those questions and also for that wonderful summary. Uh, uh, you, your first question was related to why why did the decline begin by about 2011, 12 itself? Uh, uh, I will very. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm worried that I might uh, uh, end up being less rigorous in my answer because the time is short, but I'll try to summarize my point, uh, which is that uh, one of the key drivers of that slowdown was the global financial crisis of 2007 and 8, uh, yeah. which actually precipitated uh, a, a bad situation. Uh, it precipitated into a bad situation. Uh, between 2008 and 11, India tried to remain afloat uh, with a fiscal stimulus package. I remember Pradam Mukherjee was the uh, chief finance minister at that time. But uh, from about 2011 onwards, India decided to uh, end that fiscal stimulus package. Uh, and then, uh, uh, that, so, so you, you have a complete absence of counter-cyclicality in fiscal policy. But also, on the other hand, what, what, what also happens is the global economy also goes on a downturn. So uh, the global situations are like, the situation is unfavorable. Plus, India also moves into a shrinkage in a fiscal sense. So both these uh, added together uh, uh, means that you have a slowdown beginning in 2011-12 itself. Yet another factor that I would add to is that between the financial crisis of 2008 uh, and 2011, that those two or three years, uh, you saw uh, Indian banks providing enormous amounts of loans uh, uh, including to not so credit worthy borrowers in that period as a result what you see in that period is also the fact that a lot of these loans go uh, uh, go bust uh, and uh, in, that's the time when npas begin to rise so the banking sector by 2011 is also on the verge of a crisis so all these things come together by 2011 global uh, uh, global uh, uh, financial variables, sorry, global economic variables, uh, India's uh, fiscal shrinkage, and uh, the banking crisis in India. All that uh, sort of converged uh, by 2011-12 to begin that spiral downwards. Then by 2016, you have demonetization reform. All of this further added to the problems. And by 2019, you are reduced to your 3% growth rate as opposed to your 8%, 9% growth rate in 2011-12. That's my short answer uh, to yeah. your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, your second question was regarding Kerala. Uh, now, uh, you, your question was about what is the impact on agriculture, industry, and services. I would, uh, and I'm not, I'm not taking a cop out, but I'm basically trying to say that we have authored a very detailed report on the extent of losses for the Kerala economy, and it's available in the Kerala State Planning Board website. I request you to uh, uh, interested uh, scholars to actually go and see that, and our method is very uh, listed very clearly there. Uh, uh, the, the key point is the following. Uh, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, a lesser loss in agriculture because we are looking at about 4,000 to 5,000 crore uh, loss in agriculture, but the losses in the industrial sector and services sector are likely to be far higher. Uh, in the services sector, tourism is one of the most important services sectors in India. Uh, we are looking at a total loss of something like 25,000 crore in 2021. That's a total loss just in the tourism sector. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, industrial sector, uh, we are looking at another loss of about 25 to 30,000 crore there. Uh, so put all these things together, the overall loss in the Kerala economy is likely to be somewhere between 70,000 to 80,000 crore in 2021. That's our uh, approximation uh, of losses for this period. Uh, 
in terms of uh, uh, in terms of government revenues there is a report by the gulati institute uh, uh, gift which is which has been put out they actually think that the total loss of revenues is likely to be somewhere between 10000 crore to 15000 crore so that much is likely to be the shrinkage of government expenditure uh, 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 in this year and if additional borrowing is not allowed by the central government or if more funds don't come from the center we are unlikely uh, we are uh, we might see a shrinkage of total government expenditure to the tune of about 15000 crore uh, so that though, that's a snapshot of the sectoral losses as well as uh, overall economic losses and where we stand in terms of expenditures uh, which are important when we talk of revival uh, this uh, uh, more details are available in the uh, in the planning board report which is up on the website you can go and see uh, uh, at some time I'll, I'll try to post a link on the chat box uh, but this is the this is my answer so if you look at what is to be done here we are looking at different options uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, subiksha kerala uh, is actually a scheme uh, which has been envisaged with the uh, with the with the uh, with the projection that uh, uh, our food security will become extremely important in the near future if the pandemic is continuing so kerala is enormous uh, uh, fallow land and uh, the whole fallow free agriculture culture concept has been introduced which means that we are trying to uh, increase the extent of cultivation in every inch of land that is possible uh, in the state that is one set of initiatives uh, we also uh, have initiatives in animal husbandry fisheries etc there's enormous scope for inland aquaculture uh, in kerala that is something that we need to uh, exploit from here on uh, we also uh, need to have special initiatives in industry for example one of the other reports that which is again uh, you can find in the kerala state planning board website is another report that uh, my colleague uh, dr jen jos thomas has uh, authored which is uh, where will kerala focus on in terms of industries according to the committee uh, the key focus could be in the, in in medical equipment yesterday you saw the chief minister inaugurating a medical park but medical uh, devices park that is one of the initiatives but the key point that we try to make is that uh, uh, from here on the demand for medical equipment is likely to be very high in the overall industrial sector and kerala can actually become some kind of a leader in the production of medical devices it could be gloves it could be different equipment it could be uh, simple things like stethoscopes but you you'll see a major increase in demand for these items in the near future and kerala should position itself to be ready to exploit that advantage in the industrial sector that is another major sector uh, tourism we need a major rebranding of kerala Uh, uh, in terms of tourism, old God's own country. Uh, uh, the rep repeating that slogan won't be enough. We need to uh, we need to look at the total number of tourists, which might start increasing by September 2021. Um, it's a long shot. I'm saying that till September 2021, we are unlikely to see a major inflow of tourists into Kerala. So we should position for 2021 September and start a rebranding exercise now, which would uh, uh, attract more. We should. we should use the uh, tag of kerala as a clean state as a state which uh, uh, which was able to uh, uh, address the covid epidemic in some uh, covid pandemic with some amount of success all these should be positives which that we should make use of to attract people into kerala so that is another way in which service sector can be given a boost so there are different sectors but i'm just giving you a snapshot the details are there in the reports that i mentioned uh, but i will just summarize that in this way uh, for now okay thank you uh, thank you professor ram kumar and i think this gives lots of uh, uh, inputs for researchers in terms of what we should research upon and what what our, where our focus of research should be because under the school of business management and uh, legal studies we have commerce we have uh, researchers in economics management and i think all these issues converge by and large uh, on these uh, counts and even in agriculture i was uh, i was because you said uh, at the national level agriculture perhaps cannot become a vehicle for that uh, change but in kerala we have seen a dramatic increase in uh, the production of vegetables and all which was just flowing from our neighboring states so i think some uh, certain things are happening on a positive note and uh, perhaps we we'll have to work hard on the changes that come that should come for us So thank you so much. And now I am. Uh, we'll we are open for questions which others would like to raise. Uh, I think some of the questions have come on the chat box. Uh, may I request Amli to kindly take over and uh, post those questions on the chat box? And can I can, to, can yeah. I simply can I simply look at it and answer? Yeah, yeah that would be fine if you can. 
Yeah, yeah so okay. I'll that. do that. I'll do that. Thank you. Uh, so let me take one by one. Uh, uh, what uh, what is the level of return of NRIs uh, into our economy in the future? That's one of the questions that's being asked. It's been posted from YouTube live, uh, YouTube live from Lakshmi. Uh, uh, so the, if I assume this question is about Kerala. Uh, so my answer is the following. Uh, look, about uh, 300,000 persons approximately have registered in the Kerala government's website, the Norca website, as to uh, be expressing the wish to come back to Kerala. So we can safely say that this three lakh people is probably the upper end of what we might see in terms of return migration. All of this three lakh may not return, but my own personal view is that we will still see about uh, one lakh people returning to the state uh, as a result of the pandemic uh, and the job losses therein. Uh, that is likely to be a permanent uh, return. Uh, now, if you look at it closely, what we need to do is to we need to look carefully. Now, currently, that is a survey that uh, that's an initiative that uh, the government of Kerala is currently undertaking that what are the skill sets that are available with this one lakh or three lakh people who have registered? What kind of education do they have? What kind of skill do they bring? For example, if you see many of these Gulf regions uh, have had uh, wonderful experiences with technologically precise uh, techniques of farming, including in urban areas. So uh, precision farming is something that uh, uh, is greatly uh, present in uh, these Middle Eastern countries. So are people uh, there who are coming back with these skills and can we make use of uh, uh, their uh, skill uh, and uh, sort of contributing a little more of entrepreneurship to their effort. Uh, can we help them to set up uh, self-employment outlets? That is one very important uh, effort that is currently. Uh, no, I just gave you the example of precision farming, but there are multiple skills that people may come back with. So how do we use these skills uh, for generating employment and entrepreneurship in the economy itself? That is one major effort that we have to undertake. Uh, this will uh, lead to another important problem, which is indirect, which is falling remittances. And there is no actual estimate of uh, correct estimate of remittances. Um, the member of the committee, which is actually estimating it currently, but we still don't have approximations yet. We'll be have it in a few weeks from now. <coughs> but the, uh, there will be a fall of remittances into the Kerala economy, uh, which will shrink economic activities inside, that is expenditure inside. So construction activities may shrink. Uh, so that will lead to uh, 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 negative linkage impacts in the economy. So th or those are those Im impacts, uh, uh, those are impacts that we should be ready for. Uh, but at the same time, we should look at it in a positive sense. We, sh we, we should see how we can make use of this return of people who are returning uh, for uh, the improvement of our economy. That is an effort that we are uh, interested in. Now, I'll give you another example. Uh, I give you the, uh, I, I, I mentioned the case of inland aquaculture in a big way. Look at the number of ponds and rivers that Kerala has. Uh, and I think there is extraordinary uh, possibility of inland fisheries growing in a big way in Kerala. And we have not yet exploited that possibility at all. Uh, if can't we, for example, uh, encourage groups of people, groups of youngsters, even young group of young women, to uh, lease in uh, uh, these small ponds and uh, so on that we have in different parts of the state? Uh, 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 state government has a scheme to supply fish seeds at a very subsidized rate, and if you do that, in about five or six months, you can start having a, a excellent fish catch. And that can be used to improve incomes in our uh, rural areas in particular in a big way. So this is a possibility that we have not exploited at all. Even in rivers, you can actually experiment with techniques like cage farming, which will uh, ensure that you know fish don't flow away. So this, these, these possibilities should be used. Uh, look at, for example, uh, 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 within agriculture itself. Look at a, uh, look at a subsector like dairy, okay, uh, or, or look at a subsector like poultry. I'll give you an example there. Every day, every day, Kerala imports two crore eggs into the state. Two crore eggs are uh, imported into the state daily in Kerala. Okay, can't we produce that many eggs within the state by uh, by a, an innovative program to expand uh, uh, homestead poultry? That's a possibility that we should look at. So there are. Uh, enormous possibilities that exist where Kerala, the vegetable example that Professor Simon was mentioning is a case in point where we are, there is a, there is about uh, 10 lakh tons of 
vegetables imported into the state can't we produce that here can that income be generated within the state these are all possibilities that we should uh, uh, examine in the near future and we need to examine how best to generate maximum income from unit land that is that should be one focus area of our attention uh, in the near future so uh, uh, yes nris are going to return uh, they, we, have, we have to give jobs to them and they will also be, that will also mean that remittances are going to come down but we should be ready with our own innovative programs to meet uh, that particular challenge akhil asks uh, due to the pandemic we have seen human migration what do you think about the return to the mainstream economy this will and uh, let me tell you this has slowly started already a lot of workers have begun to come back to cities but they are finding it difficult to get back their jobs even if they get some uh, are able to get some jobs they are able to get only low paid jobs and low skill jobs they are very unhappy with the jobs that they get so uh, this is where i uh, i think that the sectoral packages that i spoke about becomes very important we need to understand that we need to protect employment in multiple sectors which have seen major job losses and this mean careful selection of which are the most labor intensive uh, uh, economic sectors that we have and how best to protect uh, uh, firms from not sinking uh, in these sectors so we need a very careful attention into sectoral packages that's something that i've always advocated during this period uh, uh, you mentioned about the stimulus package please elaborate the meaning of stimulus package without liquidity measures what i mean here <coughs> is that uh, primarily loan and liquidity measures are those measures of the government whereby the government is giving people increased amount of loans or credit from the banking system <coughs> sorry which will act to inject liquidity into the system or the firms but these are loans which have to be returned with an interest at a later stage uh, but what i mean by above the line or direct measures is those steps where the government is directly assisting the uh, the firms or people uh, with financial assistance which are not to be returned that is not which are not loans that kind of assistance is really required in uh, uh, in in our economy look at donald trump donald trump what he is doing of course it's an election year for him so he would do that but if you look at his uh, package he is basically giving each farmer each farmer about 7000 to 8000 dollars at the end of it right which covers about 70 to 80% of the price losses the farmer has suffered in the united states he is also going to give every small business up to 50000 dollars in 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 terms of direct financial assistance these are uh, a similar uh, packages can be seen in the european union also so these are packages that you see globally uh, uh, we, we, we can at least begin to mimic them a little bit we can at least think of smaller packages for different sectors something that we should urgently uh, do so this is what i mean by stimulus package with and without liquidity measures uh, how a cut in economic links with china will affect, uh, affect our economy yes uh, this is a this is a very important question because i think the following is a point uh, if you look at uh, china and in trade between india and china uh, india simply cannot afford to cut trade with china because most of the imports from china into india are actually importing intermediate goods for indian industries okay so uh, uh, if you are stopping trade with china you are actually cutting the branch in which you are sitting basically you are basically harming your own industries which are dependent on import of intermediate goods in india right so as a result they will have to go to other sources other sources of these uh, intermediate goods which certainly will not be as cheap as you get it from china so your costs of your industrial growth uh, industrial performance will actually uh, uh, rise if you do uh, in, simply cut trade with uh, china very blindly I, I assume both China and India are aware of this more than anyone else, and they will act more calmly, rationally, uh, not allow uh, uh, extreme right-wing ultra-nationalist voices to take over the discourse, and they will sit down across the table, talk to each other, and come to a peaceful conclusion of this whole uh, drama that is unfolding in the fall. In, in, in the borders it's something that is that we urgently need. We should not fall prey to um, uh, ultra. Uh, nationalist uh, uh, sort of uh, statements uh, 
either side of the border. Uh, Ilango Natarajan has asked the question, our country has already has got a higher tax rate, increasing avenues of tax as an adverse effect. Yes, I did not say that we need an across the board increase in taxes. That's not what I meant. I said that there are certain cases where you can examine if an increase in taxes would be possible. For example, I have long thought that India needs an inheritance tax. Uh, that is, if you are inheriting more than rupees two crore from uh, your father, two crore is an arbitrary number. You can make it one crore, three crore. But just say, if you if you borrow, if you inherit more than rupees two crore from your parents, you have to pay fifteen percent tax on it. That's very clear. That is an inheritance tax that uh, exists in, for example, United Kingdom in a big way. So these are ta these are taxes. Wealth taxes is another option. We should examine these uh, options. Uh, to generate more resources, but I understand that this is not the best time to think about a range of tax increases. That's not what I'm saying, but wherever possible, we should try to examine that, that as a source of finance uh, for the government. Uh, and Mary Alexandra has this question, as a result of the pandemic, MSME was badly affected. How far do you think the collateral free COVID loans and other packages will help in uplifting the sector? Yes, they will. They will uh, help. But in fact, I would point to experiences in uh, Japan, Belgium, etc., which actually not which are which don't just give collateral free COVID loans to MSMEs, they also give interest free loans to MSMEs, right? So, I would argue for collateral free, interest free loans to MSMEs as an important measure to uh, increase their liquidity. That is something that uh, I would add uh, to uh, your uh, your question, but I think collateral free COVID loans are very important. I'm just simply adding one more component to it, which is zero interest rate. Uh, Akhil asked this question, since you have the academic field, what are the major disruptions in the education sector? Uh, physical classrooms becoming Google classrooms, seminars becoming webinars, as we are now. Uh, in this scenario, what do you think about faculty requirements? Will it increase or decrease? This is a major turning point for uh, churning and turning point for in education across the world. Uh, in fact, if you look at the American model of education or even the English model of education, British model of education, what we see very clearly is that that business model is failing. Many American universities or British universities are not taking adequate students this time. And all this is seriously affecting their bottom line. And this is has, this has already led to uh, 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 dismissing or sort of uh, firing of a large number of uh, ad hoc faculty across the world and uh, the use of uh, uh, webinar or the internet tools for uh, taking classes is being used to uh, reduce the number of teachers that's uh, that's clearly something that is happening uh, globally but in india the education model is not yet there we have some private universities which do this but we still have many universities in the public sector so you don't see retrenchments happening in a big way but but if the funding to education higher education in particular is increasing in the is not going to increase in the near future and if it actually decreases in the near future you will actually see the uh, all the uh, many of the ad hoc faculty members who are employed in universities, their number being cut, and you will see job losses in India also. So it's very important that we fight for uh, retaining uh, public funding in the education sector uh, so that these uh, uh, perverse consequences that we see in the Western countries are not repeated in uh, in India. That is one major uh, requirement of the time. Uh, but you, there is another point, which is that I am really worried about the uh, uh, the absence of physical classrooms. I think the uh, the uh, presence of uh, uh, the presence of the coming in of uh, 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 online modes of teaching has uh, uh, exposed or laid bare the problem of digital divide in our country. I think there are a large number of students who do not have. Now, in my class of 45 yesterday, I clearly found that at least four or five people did not have stable internet. So they they uh, uh, were they were not able to they they they, they have very small phones. So even if I use PowerPoint slides, uh, they are not able to read the slides properly, and this leads to an exacerbation of the consequences of the digital divide. So it's not something that is. Uh, uh, that's not something that is pleasant uh, that is happening, and we need to really worry about this uh, situation. Uh, Ilango has another question. To some extent, GST aimed at formalizing the majority of the economic activity. Uh, COVID lockdown has worked the other way around. I, I, the, I, in fact, 
uh, you saw a little bit of movement from formal uh, informal to formal with the coming in of gst and uh, if 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 firms are really uh, going to be in a difficult state financially you might see the reverse actually happening you're right uh, so you, you you there will be many firms which will move from formal to informal even if that is to save taxes so that is likely to be a perverse consequence of uh, this slow, uh, this uh, pandemic uh, it's too early to say so but uh, we shall, we have to wait and watch tourism ambili has this question about it and bpos it seems mncs have been profiting from work from home model that they adopted during the covid period yes i've heard of that but uh, but uh, in sectors like it i'm not that pessimistic i think there will be some pick up of activity because uh, you have a lot of uh, 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 the, the the activity the economic activities in the it sector i don't i don't think they will fall to the extent uh, that other sectors have so i think uh, the losses may not be that much but still you will see you will still see losses there uh, and there are uh, the, the the whole the whole way of people work the whole nature of work uh, in these sectors is likely to change and uh, uh companies will indeed as you say look for work from home models which are more profitable to, for them which will cut costs for them and uh, whether that will affect an employment adversely how will that affect the total number of jobs generated is yet to be seen but uh, my hope is that it doesn't turn out to be uh, 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 turn out to have negative consequences for overall employment generation in the economy that's something that we should need to be worried about the department of commerce uh, as a result of the pandemic many people have lost their jobs you think of new innovative jobs which can solve this problem how will you train the existing workers work for, workforce for these jobs the second part is something that i agree with the first part i don't know the answer but the second part is very much there we 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 have already lacked uh, in a uh, skill generation in our workforce skill uh, uh, imparting skills is something that we urgently need to do which, which was even prior to the pandemic that was a necessity in fact post pandemic that has become an even greater responsibility of the governments we need really large uh, 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 skill generation uh, skill imparting programs which will make people employable in fact uh, unemployability has been one of the big problems in, in the uh, on the educated side of the workforce in india and we need to really work on that very hard uh, in, in fact a lot of funds needs to flow uh, into that sector uh, is this the right time to invest in research and development indeed indeed yes not just in vaccines and so on but it is also the time uh, uh, to invest in uh, startups for example this is the time when we need in innovative technologies innovative interventions in different economic sectors uh, including in supply chains so we need to look at uh, r and d and we should also uh, uh sort of increase our investment and involvement in uh, the uh, the coming in of startups uh, kerala has the best startup economy uh, best startup ecosystem uh, in in india it's got awards for it recently and we should understand that kerala should actually be kerala started the first it park in india in 1990 techno park but it couldn't sort of catch up uh, with other states like uh, andhra pradesh or karnataka that should not happen with startups we should we should catch up right now we should grow right now and we should be uh, a leader in startups uh, very soon uh, that should be our focus in that researching uh, investing in r and d will be a very central feature uh, the last question i think uh, uh, dr sadar uh, what's your view on make in india and economic stimulus package i i did mention it but if you if you are specifically asking about make in india i would say that uh, make in india was not a greatly well designed program to begin with itself uh, i think that uh, make in india uh, you know i i have that's a problem that i have with many of the schemes of the government there's a lot of spectacle in it there's a lot of noise in it but very little substance in it uh, that is my opinion with uh, for example a scheme like the mudra scheme that's my opinion with the make in india scheme or um, <laughs> let it be with the swachh bharat abhiyan or with uh, what is it stand up india sit down india kind of uh, uh, names we are greatly stuck with these nomenclatures uh, with very little content in them very little thinking about how to design schemes we have we have greatly lacked uh, in that 
part of uh, uh, scheme formulation and planning. And this means that we, uh, uh, so, so I'm not a great uh, fan of this Make in India. I'm hardly surprised that it has failed as a model. I have been saying that from day one. Uh, so, so that's not surprising that uh, it's a it's a disconnect. Uh, there's a disconnect is very clearly visible. Uh, uh, new agricultural policy will help economic recovery. And in fact, I've written about it. I don't think the new agricultural policy will help economic recovery. I've given two interviews in this regard. One to this website called India Spend. The other. Uh, I've given another interview to the Huffington Post. Uh, you can see that, and uh, you can see that on my website, uh, uh, in my in the in, in the official pages of TISS, and you will see that I I argue in those pages that in those interviews that uh, the agricultural policy, if you're if you're referring to the farm bills, they're hardly to be uh, likely to be of any help in reviving uh, agricultural marketing in India. Uh, uh, banks are not helping industries; they are not willing to extend moratorium for loans. Uh, if banks have to extend moratorium for loans the central government should tell the banks to do so banks will be def uh, banks will be hesitant to extend moratoriums because it will lead to loss of incomes for the banks so the banks are likely to look forward to the government for a compensation to be paid by recapitalizing these banks for any loss of incomes due to further moratoriums that's very clear banks function on a prof uh, commercial basis so unless the government comes forward and promises a recapitalization of banks in lieu of compensating for the losses they might incur in uh, terms of uh, moratoriums or debt reliefs etc uh, banks are likely to uh, insist on loan repayments that would mean that NPS will start rising from next month onwards and uh, the uh, you will see very close to a banking crisis which can spill over further into complicating the situation in the real sector as well that's so that's a that's a really uh, bleak scenario that we are staring at uh, in that sense last question what's your opinion regarding India's stand towards RCEP it is is this the time to rethink RCEP to begin with was not a great trade deal, trade deal to speak about. RCEP would have greatly adversely affected India's dairy sector, uh, where India is actually completely self-sufficient. So, uh, it is like uh, uh, undoing the benefits of green revolution in agriculture, something very similar to that. Uh, India's Operation Flood was one of the uh, greatest success stories after independence. India is today self-sufficient in milk production, and the RCEP uh, agreement would have completely undone our gains in uh, terms of our uh, gains in the dairy sector. We may have had some gains in the IT sector and so on, but our dairy farmers would have been devastated by our CEP agreement. So I uh, I don't think our CEP is a great agreement. Again, I have written about it, uh, uh, that it is a good thing that India did not sign it, uh, and I continue to hold that view. There is one comment by Linish who wants to ask a question directly, but I should leave that to uh, the moderator, whether yeah, that yeah, is yeah. allowed or not. Uh, I, I will leave the stage to Dr. Simon. Yeah, you can ask, please. Please raise the question that you want. Unmute and ask. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Simon, sir. Sir, yeah. sir, my question is that the corporates are facing liquidity issues. Uh, RBI uh, pumped around uh, 1 lakh crore as LTR, that is long term repo operations, yeah. and uh, easing uh, monetary policies. The main intention of RBI to facilitate commercial banks to uh, purchase corporate bonds. That's the main intention behind RBI uh, for declaring the LTR, that is long term repo operation. Why corporates are not ready to issue bonds? Sir, is this the is this uh, because that is this the decrease of the yeah, sir, is this the uh, decrease of the private consumption or commercial banks are hesitating to uh, uh, release the funds, uh, which is the problem. That is, a uh, fund is uh, in the hands of commercial banks. Yes. See. Right from for about four to five years now, in fact, even prior to that, from 2011 onwards, when we saw domestic credit supply was falling uh, in India, there was not one year in which India was not in excess liquidity in its banking system. India always has had excess liquidity in its banking system for about a decade now. The real problem, that is why it has been said again and again that our problem is not, our crisis is not a cyclical crisis, it is actually a structural crisis. That means if you, one or two indicators would suffice. If you look at uh, the unutilized capacity in industry, 
Okay, the unutilized capacity in industry has been growing rapidly okay, over the last 10 years. That is just one indicator. The uh, overall consumption has declined if you look at NSS surveys. Uh, so uh, this means that India has over the last decade faced a major crisis of demand, aggregate demand. And this meant that uh, you, the, the supply side focus of our interventions was not the right policy to adopt. We needed strong demand side interventions which we were not doing with any counter-cyclical fiscal policy. So the key point is that banks were flush with liquidity, but no industrialist was uh, ready to risk it and go and take a big loan because they simply did not see the demand available for those investments and productions that would follow. This is the reason why domestic credit supply has fallen, not because banks were not ready to lend. Banks were ready to lend, but in fact, uh, even prior to the pandemic, uh, the SBI's managing director and chairman was saying, I am sitting on one lakh crore, nobody is coming and asking me for a loan. Right? This is primarily because industrialists were in a, in a bad state. They did not see the investment environment as being conducive to be able to, for them to go and take a loan uh, for a new investment. So I that is why I believe that this all, all these monetary policy interests changes uh, 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 you know, push, try, trying to push in more loans through in, uh, liquidity measures, etc., are likely to be less effective than direct fiscal policy. I would argue that that is the way to go ahead. This monetary policy interventions may help you at the margins, but that's not going to really help you in your economic revival. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ram. Uh, it was a, in fact a wonderful session. We have had uh, lots and lots of uh, questions and discussion points, and I, I'm sure the participants have many things more to raise. We had initially planned this for one hour, and now it is more than two hours, and we have had the entire group with us. That itself indicates the interest that you can, uh, you have uh, been uh, successful in generating on this particular issue. Now, we have all seen that the virus has done a lot of damage uh, to the economy and to each one of us. But it is for us to collectively put our brains and minds together and see how you, we can come out of this and we can uh, look at sectoral packages, look at uh, issues in totality where it needs to be in totality and see that we put our economy, put our lives back into the uh, normal course for which we need to do all that we uh, should do. Thank you so much, Professor Ramkumar, and we look forward for your uh, support and inputs in future as far as the Department of Commerce, University of Kerala is concerned. I also thank uh, all my colleagues, all the participants for uh, their inputs, and specifically those who raised uh, their concerns and their thoughts and have taken something out of this as a takeaway from this uh, particular session. So thank you all, and over to you, Ambali, to conclude the uh, session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. This has become really successful in the form of, you know, a platform for discuss discussing, for actually having a really good discussion. Now, let's move on to what of thanks. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Biju A.V., the program coordinator, as well as assistant professor of the Department of Commerce, University of Kerala, to propose the word of thanks. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, Am I audible? Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, respected dignitaries. Uh, uh, Dean Professor uh, Rasya Begum, uh, Professor Head of the Department Dr. Raju, uh, Professor Simon Tatil, uh, Professor Hari Kumar, Professor Biju Terence, uh, and my colleagues uh, Lakshmi, we knew all the participants. It was an amazing lecture, it was an academic dinner from an academic genius and totally different experience to commerce people because a person from economics has given the tremendous resources with the data support and to go to know that the position of Indian economy is pathetic. Uh, and India is the most COVID affected economy in all sectors. We are a failure after COVID. Professor Ram Kumar agreed for a 40 minutes lecture. Now it has reached two and a half hours. The lecture uh, we have witnessed by Professor Ram Kumar was based on the working paper published by National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. I think our scholars have got a lot of sparks after his presentation of making new, uh, new papers based on this. Soon after I noticed uh, the working paper from the website, I had texted in the chat box of sir, we can plan a lecture. And immediately sir has agreed and said fix. 
uh, fixed in the next week. The person who wrote uh, widely popular books such as Not Ban the India's Elusive Chase for Black Money, published by Oxford Press and also popular academician in the country, and how published many relevant papers in top class journals. Having understood the fact that Professor Ram Kumar is busy with a lot of academic activities and media debates in the regional as well as national channels. Nowadays, Sar is very busy, busy, you know, the farm bill passed by the parliament and further debates going on in the country regarding the policy matter implication and also he is taking the key role as a criticizer of the farm bill passed by the parliament. An academician with a lot of followers in the country, inside country as well as abroad. I remember one incident when the demonetization policy by the government, so has given a notice to the cashier in a bank in writing. I believe the words of the prime minister and finance minister of India, uh, something like that, that the news was so, so viral. And so I had an intervention that was viral at that time. The government, the RBI, national media were taken that issue very seriously due to the timely intervention of Sir. When you search Ram Kumar in the Google, you will get uh, speeches, debates, etc. I, I would say a revolutionary academician with a lot of critical thinking on the policy matters of government from time to time. We are greatly delighted to have a session with you, Sir. Thanks a lot for the lecture delivered on our platform. Hope many lectures from Ram Kumar will be pop up and organized by the Department of Commerce. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, at this outset, uh, I express my sincere thanks and gratitude to my HOD, Professor Raju sir, for the wholehearted supports. Like always, he do that. At this outset, I express my sincere gratitude to Professor Rasia Begum, Dean, Faculty of Commerce, University of Kerala, for witnessing the lecture and support. Of course, Professor Simon Turtle is uh, with us always, even though Sar is very busy with the entire university matters as an accuracy director, and all Sar has found time to concentrate here. Thanks a lot, Sir. Sincere thanks to Professor Hadi Kumar, Sir, Dr. Biju Teren, Sir, for the cooperation and support always. That is amazing. Uh, thank you, Sir. Thank you, Mr. Vinu, for the program, uh, the program assistant, who done a wonderful effort in the technical side and back office. Thanks to Lakshmi for the support given by her and timely relevant information and support given to me and for the commendable effort done by technical support for YouTube live streaming of this lecture. Without Lakshmi's timely interference, uh, it would not be possible. Sincere thanks to researchers forum, especially Anandu Raj for the timely assistance. Thanks to Ampli Jaychandran for the work of comparing in an excellent way. You know, uh, she knows the business of art of anchoring. Thanks to the Ender Scholars community and respected professors from various colleges and universities across the country and from Dubai and some other international participants also witnessed uh, this uh, commendable lecture uh, for the patient listening of the program. Thank you all. Uh, over to you, Ambil. Thank you, sir. So with this, we have come to the end of the session. Uh, we look forward to having you with us for uh, future in intellectual interactions that we might have the opportunity to have with you, sir. Thanks again. Thank you all the participants for making this discussion really lively. And thanks again. Thank let's let's uh, create more opportunities and meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Ram Kumar, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night to all.